What's stopping you from becoming a Catholic? Why can't women become priests? Why do Catholics worship Mary? Why do I need to confess my sins to a priest? Where is purgatory in the Bible? I think the Pope has too much authority. What's stopping you? You are called to communion with Dr. David Anders on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Hey, everybody. Welcome again to Call to Communion. This is the program for our non-Catholic brothers and sisters. That's right. We're looking for uh, fallen away Catholics. We're looking for people who have never been a Catholic, uh, people who just have curiosity about the Catholic faith. Uh, maybe you've got a dear friend or a, or a co-worker who's Catholic, and you're thinking, man, what have they got that I don't have? Well, you can get those questions answered right here on this program. Here's our phone number, 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. You can also text the letters EWTN to 55000. Wait for our automated response, and then text us your first name and your brief question. Message and data rates may apply. Again, that phone number, 833 833- 288-EWTN. Michael Birchfield is our producer. Matt Kabinsky is our phone screener. Jeff Burson is on social media today, so he can pass on any questions that you might pose via Facebook or YouTube. I'm Tom Price, along with Dr. David Anders. Tom, how are you today? I am doing great. How about you, my friend? I'm doing pretty well, thanks. You seem a little uh, subdued. Are, is, is, it, is the summer getting to you? Oh no, I'm I'm actually fine. I um I was I was trying to kind of get in the theology zone in, the, ah. in my mind. I actually was looking at the text on the computer about the next question coming up, and I thought, oh, this might be interesting. Let this me will be this, think through this. Yeah, thing. this will be very interesting. This is a question that we received from R J, who was watching us on YouTube. R J says, "I was a Southern Baptist preacher, and I believed that I was saved because of trust in Jesus." Do Catholics believe you are saved by trust in Jesus alone? Thank you. Appreciate the question. Um, how I answer this will depend uh, really on what you mean by saved, mm. what you mean by trust, what you mean by Jesus alone. We got so there's a there's a way I could construe all of those words to answer the question yes, and there's a way I can construe all those concepts in it in order to answer the question no. So. Better, perhaps, for me to just lay out for you the way in which Catholics understand the path of salvation and union with God, and then you can draw your own conclusions. Sounds good. So the Catholic Church teaches, and we believe that through Adam we have all inherited a wounded human nature, right? It's still good, but it's wounded, mm-hmm. um, and uh, and therefore we're 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 in we're we're prone to sin, all right? And not only do we have a wounded human nature, but because we're nature, because we're natural, we're creatures, there's nothing in us that deserves or or can demand an eternity of bliss with God. So both because we need the wounds of our nature healed, and because, hey, if we're going to make it off this rock that we're sitting on, it's only going to be because God carries us off of it, you know? Yeah. We need grace. We need we need divine help. We need supernatural help, right, in order to, in order to enjoy an eternity of bliss with God in heaven, all right? And fortunately for us, that's God's plan for human life, all right? It, the, the horizon of human life is not this world, it's eternity. And he made a way for us through his son, Jesus. And so everybody who makes it to heaven, all right, everybody who is joined to God in the beatific vision of the next life, will will do so only because of the atoning work of Christ. Now, where Catholics differ from Baptists is, uh, what is it we think Jesus actually does for us? But how is it that Jesus gets us from here to there? And that's where we differ. Because many Baptists, I'd say probably most Baptists, uh, believe that uh, that Christ died on the sins to pay the penalty for our sin, um, and that if you simply believe that and accept the gift as it were, you kind of get off scot-free and your place in heaven is guaranteed. And that's what they mean by trust in Jesus. I trust that Christ has made provision for me so that I myself don't have to do anything. Or at least not of not in the area of moral striving. I may have to do things, but like it, it's essentially it's the it's the act of intellectually or emotionally entrusting myself to the cross of Christ, period, that gets me there. All right. Catholic Church understands this quite differently. Now, uh, the scripture never represents the death of Christ that way as a substitutionary punishment that that allows me to uh, 
to slough off moral responsibility. It's not the way the Bible talks about the moral life or the path of salvation or union with God. Um, instead, Scripture tells us that the death of Christ was a sacrifice of atonement that makes satisfaction to God for human sin, all right, so that uh, we can be justly forgiven. But it also says that in Christ we, we, we die and we rise again. All right, that through him we become participants in the divine nature. That's what Second Peter 1, 4 says, that the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. And, and through our relationship to Jesus, all right, especially our relationship to Christ in the church through the sacraments that he instituted, not only are we forgiven for our sins, but we are renewed interiorly. All right, St. Uh, St. Paul says that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature, new creation. The old is gone, all things have become new. All right, we have the mind of Christ. We become participants in the divine nature. Um, his love is shed abroad in our hearts. And it is ultimately through that life of love that we're united to God. All right, Jesus says, if anyone loves me and keeps my commands, my Father and I will come to him and make our dwelling within him. All right. So we're united to God. Faith is the instrument, right? But the real sticking point that unites us to God is the life of charity. St. Paul tells us in Romans 13, 8, that the love of God and neighbor is the fulfillment of the whole law. And he in whom the Spirit is at work is capable of fully meeting the demands of the law, the love of God and neighbor. Christ himself tells us that on that last day we'll be judged uh, not by not on the basis of what Christ did on the cross, but on the basis of our works, which we do in grace through charity. That's why he say to many people who say, Lord, Lord, he'll say, away from me, I never knew you, because you didn't clothe the naked or feed the hungry, give mm-hmm. drink to the thirsty, and so forth. Mm-hmm. All right, so do we trust in Christ? Yes. All right, is our salvation come to us through Christ? Yes. But how does it come to us? It comes to us by being joined to the power of his death and resurrection And the inward renewal of our hearts, the circumcision of our hearts by the Holy Spirit, the love of God shed abroad in our hearts. In that way, we come to share in the very nature of God, which is love itself. And if we persevere like that unto the end, Jesus says, we will be saved. There you go, RJ. Thank you so much for your question. We're going to do uh, one more quick email before we get to the phones here. And by the way, that number 833-288-EWTN if you have a question for Dr. David Anders. Here's one now from uh, Jane emailing us from Youngstown, Ohio. Jane says, what are the Catholic views, if any, on tattooing or piercing your body? Yeah, thanks. There's no such thing as the Catholic view on that topic. Okay. All right. There are Catholic views. There's not a Catholic, there's no authoritative statement from the church or the tradition saying, you know, thou shalt or shalt not tattoo. Okay. Um, and uh, that there are a lot of Catholics that have tattoos, and there are a lot that choose not to have tattoos. And, uh, you know, so there you go. There you go. In a moment here, we'll be talking with Mary in Barrington, Illinois. We do have a line open for you right now, 833 833- 288-EWTN, 833-288-3986. It's called a communion here on EWTN. Sharing the fullness of the Catholic faith. 1-833-288-EWTN. 1-833-288-3986. This is Call to Communion with Dr. David Anders on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. What's stopping you from becoming a Catholic? You are called to communion with Dr. David Anders. 1-833-288-EWTN. 1-833-288-3986. And if you're ready now, let's go to the phones at 833-288-EWTN. We begin with Mary in Barrington, Illinois, listening to us on Sirius XM 130. Hello, Mary. What's on your mind today? Thanks, Mary. I appreciate it. 
So the church is very clear about this, that if we are conscious of grave sin, and of course not going to Mass for a long time would, would count, all right, right, right. Then, um, then we should not receive Holy Communion until we have had uh, uh, sacramental uh, confession and absolution. So the general confession of sins in the Mass, in the liturgy, is not sufficient uh, to, uh, to make us properly disposed to receive Holy Communion. Now, um, uh, while, it's, it, while it's a great good to receive Holy Communion, the point of the Mass is not, is not done away with if you don't receive Holy Communion. Your participation in Mass can be very fruitful, very purposeful, uh, if you unite yourself to the holy sacrifice of the Mass, unite yourself to the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, represented there for us in the holy sacrifice of the Mass, and offer prayers uh, you know, on behalf of the universal church and your loved ones and yourself, um, your participation in Mass can be very, very, very fruitful, even if you don't receive Holy Communion. All right, right. Yeah. So don't feel like, you know, just because I hadn't been to confession and I can't go to communion, therefore my Mass is somehow wasted. That's That's far from true. In fact, you know, for many people, if uh, maybe maybe a lot of reasons you might not go to communion, and one of them is you're you're not properly disposed. Another one, you know, in terms of confession, another one might be, well, maybe I didn't keep the church's fast. You know, maybe oh, yeah. I, maybe I just got off work and I was starving to death, and I scarfed down a sandwich, and I hadn't been able to keep the church's fast, so I can't go to communion. A lot of reasons people might not go, and yet they're present in the mass, and they think, man, I really would like to go to communion. Well, guess what? That 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 unfulfilled longing, that unrequited love, which is a form of suffering, mm -hmm. that can also be valuable, right? As you offer that up, join that suffering to the sufferings of Christ. So, uh, so you know, um, go to confession as soon as possible. Uh, if you can't make it to your parish on Saturday afternoon, um, many priests are willing to schedule an appointment at a time that is convenient for you. And a lot of times there may be a place to go to confession in your diocese other than your parish that you may not have thought about. You yeah, know, um, yeah. I know here in Birmingham, which is not a particularly Catholic city, we have uh, a number of places where you can receive confession on a daily basis, uh, say after the 7 a.m. Mass or 7.30 a.m. Mass. I know at my parish mm -hmm. there's always, a con always somebody in the confessional. Um, uh, here at EWTN, at the, the friars hear confessions on a daily basis. There may be a Catholic shrine, a religious community, um, or, you know, or you might just tap a priest on the shoulder. <laughs> you know, That's I mean, right. because, you know, you, uh, uh, if you are penitent and in need of the sacrament of confession, priests are actually not allowed to turn you away. Mm. Right? It's, it's part of their canonical obligation to, to make provision to hear your confession. If you can't make it at the properly scheduled time on Saturday, if that's when your parish does it, um, they, will, they will make a way for you to go to confession. Absolutely. Mary, thank you so much for your call. That opens up a line for you right now. We look, looks like we have two lines open, 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. Here's a quick text from uh, Joe watching us right now on YouTube. He says, what is the Catholic Church's position on the Didache? Can you explain yeah, that? Sure. The Didache is an ancient Christian document that is largely a manual of worship and church discipline. And it is a uh, it is a a very important historical witness to an expression of Catholic faith. You know, at the tail end of the first or the beginning of the second century, um, it uh, it's usually included within the collection of what's known as the Apostolic Fathers, which are the earliest post uh, canonical Christian literature, and thus it's an important uh, part of the Church's patrimony and witness to sacred tradition. Um, now, the Didache makes a lot of specific prescriptions. Do this, don't do that, do this, don't do that, take this fast, follow that practice, mm -hmm. celebrate the liturgy this way. None of those injunctions are mandatory for Catholics. So if you read something in the Didache, and the Didache says, hey, do it this way, and you know, in your diocese, your bishop does it another way, we're not, we're not bound to the prescriptions of the Didache. We are not Didicheists. Oh, that's you know? true, that's true. Um, yeah, but uh, uh, it, any more than than I than I have to follow the specific pastoral injunctions of any one particular church father. The way the church understands this whole body of Christian literature called the Church Fathers or the Apostolic Fathers, mm -hmm. uh, Council of Trent said that it is not lawful, uh, it's not authentic, it's not allowable to interpret the Catholic faith or the Scriptures in a way that contradicts the consensus of the fathers. Okay. All right. So when you read 
widely in ancient Christian literature, and you see, you know, hey, all, just looks like, uh, you know, the, 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 the overwhelming majority of the church fathers, you know, almost unan- unanimously interpret this aspect of Christian faith this way. Mm-hmm. Well, it would be foolhardy to go against that consensus. Yeah. In, but but on, on a, in an individual text, no, it doesn't have that kind of weight or authority in the life of a Catholic. Very good. Thanks for checking us out on YouTube today, Joe. This is called Communion here on EWTN. 833-288-EWTN is our number. Let's go now to Kalen in Indianapolis, checking us out today on the EWTN app. Hey, Kalen, what's on your mind today? Hello, Tom. Uh, First of all, I would like to thank you and David from the bottom of my heart. Um, I, over the past year, have made my way into the Catholic Church along with my wife and two children, and you guys have hands down played a very, very, very large instrumental role in our conversion. So I thank you guys from the bottom of my heart, and I love you guys, and I love EWTN. Thank you. you. Praise be to God. My question is, and you are very welcome. Thank you guys. Um, My question is, I was recently talking to um, an individual I'd met at work um, who is one of our Protestant brothers, and we were talking about purgatory, and I just had a question so I could give him some clarification maybe. Um, Not so much biblical reference for purgatory, more along the lines of, um, oh, I just drew a blank. So why there's a need for purgatory, and why Jesus' sacrifice, death, resurrection, is not enough to, quote-unquote, clean us up enough to get into heaven, and why is there a need for purgatory? Okay, Okay, thanks. I appreciate the question. I can help you on on that, uh, definitely. So, first of all, um, ask your Protestant friend if he believes that there is any sinning that goes on in heaven. Does anybody in heaven sin? Is there any impurity of thought or heart in heaven? And, of course, he's going to say, no, no, there's no no sinning in heaven. There's no impurity in heaven. So then ask him if he thinks that he is presently in a state of moral perfection and absolute purity. And he will likely confess that he is not. All right. So the question is this, if you put this to your Protestant friend. So someplace between... Uh, biological death and your entrance into heaven, you will in fact be purged of all attachment to sin. True or false? Well, true, true. He's going to say true. Okay. Do you know by what mechanism God will actually accomplish that? How is it that God is going to bring it about such that between biological death and heaven, you will in fact be purged of every attachment to sin? All right. Now, I, I think... He may have no answer at all, but I mean, I think a a thoughtful Protestant might simply say, look, I don't have any information on that. You know, it'll happen. The Scripture doesn't specify in what manner. Well, I would go, okay, well, uh, you're right that it's going to happen. You're wrong that Scripture doesn't specify or that tradition doesn't specify. We both agree that we'll be purified between now and heaven. Catholics just happen to know what the mechanism is. All right. But as to the need for moral purification... I think there, there can be no disagreement between right. you and me, all mm-hmm. right? Um, and, so, and so then we can start, that, this is only half the picture, by the way, we can start building out the, the, the case for the mode of purification that is entailed by purgatory. Um, you know, Psalm 24 says, uh, says, who can stand on the Lord's uh, holy mountain or on his holy hill? Only he who has clean hands and a pure heart. It was Christ himself who said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. So we know that purity of heart is necessary for the vision of God. Okay, well, how in fact are we purified? What does Scripture actually tell us about the mode of moral purification? Okay, well, there's only one path for moral purification laid down in Scripture, and that is what the Church calls mortification. All right? Mortification. St. Paul says, I buffet my body and make it my slave, lest having preached to others I myself might be disqualified. All right? He's doing penance. He's, He's mortifying himself. Uh, Romans 8 says, we will reign with Christ, Christ in glory if we also suffer with him, right? Jesus said, no one can be my disciple if he doesn't take up his cross and follow me, all right? That, that suffering is a necessary part of moral purification, all right? And um, uh, uh, so that's, that's part of the picture, all right? 
The other part of the picture, and this is something that's a little bit harder for your Protestant friend to understand, is that just because our sins are forgiven does not mean that we that it is not right and just and appropriate for us to make acts of reparation towards the one whom we have offended. Right? So the fact that God extends his forgiveness to us, which he does, uh, does not in, does not mean that it is that it is wrong for me to make a, ra- acts of reparation or repentance, and and uh, I think we can see this clearly in the context of a human life. So you know I've often used the illustration if I tell my son not to play baseball in the kitchen and he does anyway and the baseball goes through the window and shatters the glass, and he makes a mess of the thing, and he comes to me and says, Dad, I'm really sorry, and I see that he is. I am of course going to extend forgiveness to him. And our relationship is restored and we're not alienated anymore. But because I love him, not because I need it, but because I love him, I'm also going to hand him a dustpan and a broom and say, now go to work. Clean it up. Prove your repentance, you know. And it's for his own good, right? I mean, I could probably clean it up easier myself. But it's because I know I regard his dignity as a moral agent, and understand that this is an important part of his self-respect mm-hmm. and of his growing into maturity as a human being, right? That he take responsibility for himself. I've forgiven him. We're reconciled. We're sure. restored. It's not a condition of forgiveness. It's a condition of justice, all right? And in the same way we do, we can do penance towards God even after we've been uh, forgiven. And this is a biblical idea, all right? I'm not making this up out of my head. Uh, King David is my paradigm example in the scriptures of someone who did grievous wrong, repented, was forgiven, and subsequently did penance. Take a look at 2 Samuel 12 and 2 Samuel 24 for illustrations of that. And David himself understood very well that this is what he was doing when uh, when he is offered uh, the cattle of an Israelite to offer in sacrifice to God. He says, no, 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 I'll pay for it. I refuse to offer the Lord a sacrifice that costs me nothing. You know, I, it's necessary for me to make some 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 act of reparation, some gift of self in reparation for the thing that I've done, even though he'd already had forgiveness extended to him and been repented. And uh, as far as the the existence of purgatory is concerned, um, it, it can be inferred from the practice of praying on behalf of the dead, which we can find in passages like Second Maccabees chapter twelve. Uh, even in in uh, Saint Paul's pastoral epistles, when he prays for his friend Anisiphorus, and of course in the in the um, longstanding universal practice of the Church in the Holy Liturgy of praying on behalf of the souls of the dead, so um, both from sacred scripture and from sacred tradition, and from logic and reason, the necessity of purgatory is well founded. Um, now, the, as to the second part of your friend's question about well, why is the death of Christ not sufficient to accomplish these goals? Well, of course the death of Christ is sufficient to accomplish these things. The death of Christ is the is the efficient power, right, in the life of sanctification, enabling us to become purified from sin and to make uh, uh, worthy acts of reparation, all right? So the, and, and of course the Protestants have a different understanding of what was accomplished on the cross, but also understand that the, we can think about the atonement of the death of Christ in two ways. There's the redemption objectively accomplished on the cross, and then there is the redemption as it is applied to us subjectively in life. All right, I must still take the power of the cross and make it my own, all right, and I do this through faith, through the sacraments, as well as through works of charity, prayer, and acts of reparation. Um, Why is it that my acts of reparation towards God are acceptable? Only because they are activated by the power of the cross, uh, present in my life through sanctifying grace. If I didn't have that, then it, I would just be, you know, pushing sticks around. That's true. Kaylin, thank you so much for your call, and thank you also for your kind words about uh, the show. We do appreciate that. In a moment, we'll be talking with Danelle in Columbus, Ohio. Danelle, that is. Also, Janine in Marion, Ohio, both listening on St. Gabriel Radio. We'll get to a couple of texts, and there's more phone calls ahead as well. 833 833- 288-EWTN. This is called a communion on EWTN. Do stay with us. What's stopping you from becoming a Catholic? You are called to communion with Dr. David Anders. 1-833-288-EWTN. 1-833-288-3986. 
so glad you could join us for this edition of Call to Communion here on EWTN. Our phone number again, 833-288-3986. We'll get to Danelle in Columbus, Ohio in just a moment. I want to get to this text first from Braden, who says, I currently attend an apostolic Pentecostal church, and I have for three years now. I do struggle, though, with the idea of being required to speak in tongues as evidence of the Holy Spirit. I have pointed out that they are there are a diversity of gifts from the same Spirit. So what if I don't have the gift of tongues? I was told that there is a different type of tongues that confirm the presence of the Holy Spirit, but I can't find anything about that in the Bible. What is the Catholic view on all this? Thanks again, Braden. Thank you, Braden. I appreciate the question. So the idea that um, glossolalia, or speaking in tongues, is the inevitable sign of an effusion of the Holy Spirit, like the one given at Pentecost. Mm-hmm. That is a novel doctrine. Novel, by novel, I mean it's fairly recent in the course of human history, of Christian history. Mm-hmm. And uh, the first time that that idea was ever articulated was uh, around 1900 by a holiness preacher in Kansas by the name of Charles Parham. All right. And it was later picked up uh, by an uh, African-American uh, holiness preacher whose name escapes me for the moment. It right. was in uh, Azusa Street in uh, Los Angeles. And the famous Azusa Street revivals spread that particular spirituality around the world, and hence modern Pentecostalism as a movement was born. I point that out because Pentecostalism as a movement is basically slightly more than 100 years old. Christianity is a lot older than 100 years. Oh, yeah. Okay. So if you had asked... Um, Uh, anybody in the whole history of the Christian tradition, uh, East or West, North or South, um, you know, Catholic, Protestant, Orthodox, uh, you know, or or whatever, any any self-identifiable Christian group anywhere in the history of the planet for 2,000 years about this idea, and they would have looked at you like you had two heads and didn't know what you were talking about, okay? Now, Christ uh, told the apostles to teach everything that he had commanded— and he gave them a promise of his divine assistance. I'll be with you to the end of the age. Okay, so it's uh, it is it is uh, implausible to the extreme that some essential doctrine of Christian faith or practice could only emerge uh, in Topeka, Kansas, in 1900 that had been unheard of for 2,000 years. All right, because the deposit of faith was given to us once and for all by Christ, mm-hmm. and then faithfully handed on. Uh, from that moment on. So right off the bat, you should be suspicious of the claims of Pentecostalism just by virtue of their novelty. Yeah. All right. Secondly, your, your intuition is correct. There is no evidence from sacred scripture or from sacred tradition that this doctrine uh, should be believed. Uh, in fact, quite the contrary. St. Paul tells us that not all have the gift of speaking in tongues, um, and that, in fact, he would prefer the Corinthian church, and you read about this in 1 Corinthians 12 and 14, he would prefer the Corinthians uh, to speak three intelligible words than 10,000 words in a tongue. Um, Even the book of Acts, which is where Pentecostals typically go to establish their doctrine, does not demonstrate the presence of tongues every time the effusion of the Spirit is given. Sometimes uh, the the coming of the Spirit is accompanied by speaking in tongues, other times by prophecy. Other times uh, we're simply told that those who receive the Spirit spoke the Word of God with boldness. All right? Um, there is some uh, there is some association between the coming of the spirit and and uh, an empowered speech, but mm-hmm. not necessarily glossolalia. All right. Now, um, one other thing about speaking in tongues in the Book of Acts, when in Acts chapter two at the event of Pentecost, when people spoke in tongues, their words were intelligible to those around them. So people who did not speak, you know, Arabic or Hebrew or Aramaic or whatnot or Greek, uh, were praising God, and those who did speak those languages understood them in their native tongues. I would venture to say that that is not what happens in your Pentecostal church, okay? Now, um, uh, linguists who have examined the modern phenomenon of glossolalia are of one mind that it is not intelligible human speech, okay? Typically, the pattern when people claim to speak in tongues is to take two or three syllables, and syllables that are drawn from their native language, Mm -hmm. right? So, you know, when I, I learned to speak French when I was in high school, and French has all kinds of sounds, all kinds of phonemes that are foreign to the English-speaking mouth. And it, it's quite difficult to learn how to pronounce some of those sounds. We have a lot of Indian priests in our diocese. I can't even begin to pronounce the terms <laughs> from their native language. Yeah. And I remember, you know, I, I, when I was in grad school, I had a lot of friends from Korea. 
and um, and uh, uh, and I'm going to mangle this. So I know. Okay, I'm thinking is a lot of friends that taught at like uh, Chungsha University, and I would ask people, "Oh, did you go to Chungsha?" And they would say, "Did I go where?" <laughs> and, you know, Chungsha, and they're like, "Where?" And they would go, "Oh, you mean Chungsha?" You know, and I'm like. Didn't I just say that? Yeah. You know, no, no, there was some subtle difference. Mm-hmm. You know, I couldn't get my mouth around the the Korean phonemes in a sure, way that sure. would be intelligible. Mm-hmm. To but when you listen to gloss- so-called accounts of speaking in tongues in the modern West, or for the, or the modern East, um, people who claim to speak always use phonemes that are familiar to their native tongue. All right, mm-hmm. they don't. They're not. They're not stretching outside that. So mm-hmm. it's implausible. Very, very implausible that. This is some kind of supernatural gift that's enabling them to actually pronounce another intelligible human language. Um, I'll tell you one other funny story about that. Um, uh, sometimes Pentecostals will speak in tongues and then someone else will claim to interpret. Uh-huh. All right. And uh, um, I, I, I know of a New Testament Greek professor who once went to a Pentecostal meeting and thought he would put this thing to the test. So they said, if anybody has a word in a tongue, you know, for edification, let's hear it. And so he opens up, you know, in our case, you know, Hannah Logos and starts reciting the uh, the prologue to the Gospel of John in Greek. And, um, you know, in Principia et Verbum. And, uh, and somebody jumps up to interpret, and he was like, it had nothing to do with the Gospel of John. Not you know? even close, right? And um, exactly, not even close. So it's, uh, you know, it's just, uh, there's pretty good evidence, at least to my mind, that the, what's going on here is a naturally occurring psycholinguistic phenomenon with cathartic effects and not something that's intrinsically supernatural. Um, so the, I don't, I don't, I have, I have no reason to believe mm-hmm. that when people claim to speak in tongues today, that they're actually doing what was on evidence uh, in, uh, in Acts chapter 2. So for, for reasons of, of, of uh, you know, neurolinguistics and psychology, for reasons of biblical exegesis for reasons of historical consideration, I think I think that the claims of modern Pentecostalism fall flat. I think what we can say about the phenomenon of speaking in tongues, oh, in addition, it's not limited to Christian congregations. It's a, it's a, that, that, uh, that uh, behavior is something's characteristic of many different religious traditions down through the years. I think we can say with certainty that it is a naturally occurring um, psychological phenomena that may have uh, it may provide some p- people with uh, an experience of release or uh, emotional detachment, uh, which you know may or may not be have, provide some sort of psychological benefit. Um, but uh, I think it's 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 stretching it um, to uh, uh, to the breaking point. I mean, stretch way beyond credibility mm-hmm. to actually to say w- that anybody could know with certainty that this is the activity of the Holy Spirit in their life. Um, and uh, you know, Holy Spirit's activity brings ultimately holiness. All right, holiness. Love, humility, um, faith, hope, and charity, um, you know, not, uh, not, uh, not in unintelligible gibberish. I had a Pentecostal guy one time who, who told me, and he meant it as a joke, but I've gotten a lot of mileage out of, this, out of this. He said, if you don't know how to speak in tongues, just say the phrase, I bought a Honda, <laughs> she bought a Honda really, really fast. Okay. And you'll be able to fool any Pentecostal. Okay. <laughs> and you just try it. Try it. I bought a Honda. She bought a Honda. Say it real quick. You know. I bought a Honda. She bought a Honda. There you go. Okay. Right? And it, I, I promise you, you do that, you pull it off anywhere you go. Very good. And it just, you know. Okay. I Look, I, I used to be a Pentecostal. All right. You know about ex-smokers? You've heard that story. You know, I used to be a Pentecostal mm-hmm. for a couple of years. And I have a lot of great friends and experiences and memories from that community. I got a lot out of it. In fact, it was an important pathway to me towards Catholicism, because oh. Pentecostalism is very attuned to the importance of Christian worship, more so than the tradition I grew up in, which was very cognitive and cerebral and doctrinal. Mm-hmm. Pentecostals opened me up to the reality that, you know, my experience of God in worship could be more than just the transfers of information, more than just cognitive content. There could actually be this very affective and emotional desire to connect to God in a transcendent way that transcended my understanding. And that's, of course, fulfilled for me in the Catholic liturgy most beautifully, right? Yeah. And I think that, that that awareness of the reality of God and the depths of prayer to which Pentecostalism was aiming, right, oriented me in a way affectively in my emotional life that made me more receptive to Catholicism. So I'm deeply appreciative of that. And of course, there are folks of outstanding holiness. I don't want to I don't want to take that away either, but wonderful people of outstanding holiness and great charity in whom the Holy Spirit is so, most certainly active within the Pentecostal tradition. Um, but uh, but please don't let yourself get all worked up and bent out of shape by that particular idea of speaking in tongues. 
Braden, thank you so much for your question. And uh, our producer, Michael Birchfield, points out that William J. Seymour was oh, the yeah, Azusa yeah, was Street a, Revivalist. I knew it was see something or another. I couldn't think of it what it was. There you go. This is called a communion here on EWTN, 833-288-EWTN is our phone number. Let's go now to uh, Dan, uh, Danelle. Got it right. Danelle in Columbus, Ohio, listening on the blowtorch there, AM 820, St. Gabriel Radio. Danelle, what's on your mind today? Oh, thank you for taking my call. Sure. I was calling regarding... Uh, Predetermination. I have a nephew who is 25, had gone through um, the Catholic Church up to confirmation, left. Now he's been speaking with the Calvinist and is thinking that uh, I believe it's predetermination sounds pretty reasonable. And I know nothing about it. I'm a lifelong Catholic, so I was trying to find if there's books or information that I can provide to him that um, address that. Say the Catholic view on that. Yeah, yes. thank you very much, Daniel. I really appreciate it. Came to the so right place. You right? came to the right place. Yeah. yeah. So, so the doctrine of pre, it's predestination is the technical term. The doctrine of predestination is a biblical doctrine. Right? Saint Paul speaks about predestination in a number of places. All right, like in Romans chapter eight, for instance. Uh, St. Paul says, uh, those whom he predestined, he also called, and those he called, he also justified. Uh, those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. Uh, Acts chapter 4, verse 28 uh, speaks about the plan of God's predestination, um, and many other passages do likewise, although using different terminology. So it's a biblical idea, and, uh, and the Catholic Church has a doctrine of predestination, um, and uh, St. Augustine of Hippo, uh, fourth century uh, doctor of the church was the the one who wrote most voluminously about predestination in the Catholic tradition. St. Thomas Aquinas, following uh, St. Augustine in the 13th century, also wrote a good bit about predestination, which you can find in his Summa Theologica, Book 1. Um, and uh, the Council of Trent mentions the doctrine of predestination. Even the Catechism of the Catholic Church talks about the doctrine of predestination. Um, I think the best one-volume introduction to the topic that I know of is by uh, Father Reginald Gary Gu Lagrange, and the title of the book is simply Predestination. Reginald Gary Gu Lagrange, Predestination. You might also read the article in the Catholic Encyclopedia on Predestination. Um, if you're not familiar with the Catholic Encyclopedia, there is a, an older version of the encyclopedia available at the website newadvent.org. The whole encyclopedia is online and searchable. Newadvent.org. Search for predestination. Read all about it. And I would uh, be shocked if the EWTN uh, archive and document archive did not also have numerous articles sure. on the doctrine of predestination. Mm -hmm. So what is it? What are we talking about here? Well, predestination refers to uh, first of all, uh, if you've read the Old Testament, and I'm sure you have, you're aware that God uh, picked out the uh, the Israelites, the descendants of Abraham, as his special possession. All right. Uh, he didn't name everybody on the planet his chosen people, but the Israelites in a special way were his chosen people. Book of Deuteronomy says, I've chosen you from all other nations on the face of the earth to be my special possession. And uh, St. Peter applies the same language to the church. He says that the church is uh, is God's elect, God's chosen one, uh, his special possession. All right, And, uh, and similar language used about the church throughout uh, the canon of the Bible. It's not uh, God, uh, in, uh, one way of putting it is to say that God has favorites. God has favorites, all right, and he does not give uh, the same measure of grace to every person, all right, but according to his plan and determination, he gives grace as he sees fit. Now, um, the over, over uh, sacred tradition, certain specifics have come out in the doctrine of predestination that all Catholics are bound to believe. Um, they are as follows. First of all, predestination refers to God's determination to give the grace that will achieve salvation for those whom he foreknows will be saved, all right? And unpacking that a bit, it means that the gift of grace, even the grace of faith that asks God for forgiveness, the beginning of faith, even the initiation of our Christian life, the initiative for that comes entirely from God and not for, from us. You know, if I'm, if I'm you know, if I'm face down in the gutter and I look up and say, I need to change my life, God, please help me, that looking up out of the gutter, that was God's initiative in my life. He put that desire in me. It didn't come from me, it came from him. Right. All right. No no one no one lifts themselves up by their own bootstraps and then asks God for help. 
comes the other way around. God reaches down to us, just like the, the model of this course is St. Paul. He's trucking along on the road to Damascus. He's, you know, hell-bent on killing Christians. Next thing you know, a lightning bolt, you know, strikes, so to speak. Christ appears and says, what are you doing, Saul? Get it straight. You know, and God calls him back to himself. It wasn't Saul's initiative. It was God's initiative reaching down to him. So the beginning of faith comes from God, not from us. Jesus says, no one comes to me, but the Father draw him. That's from John chapter 6. He says to the apostles, you didn't choose me, I chose you. Okay, the beginning of faith comes from God. The end of faith, in other words, making it to the goal, actually persevering to the end and being saved, that gift of perseverance is entirely a work of God's grace. Nobody earns the gift of perseverance. No good work I do today, no prayer I say today, no activity in which I'm presently involved in today guarantees that I will make it to the end of the road. If I persevere to the end and go to heaven, it is because God has granted me that gift of perseverance. Mm -hmm. The beginning of faith is from God. The end of faith and final perseverance is from God. Now, thus the Catholic Church teaches all that. Now, here's where we differ from the Calvinists. There are a couple places we differ from the Calvinists. Number one, along the way, even though the gift of grace comes from God and his initiative, I can freely cooperate with it. Or not. Grace can be resisted. The Catholic Church teaches that grace can be resisted. All right? I can say no to the offer of grace. The Catholic Church also teaches that if I cooperate with grace, God will give me more grace. More grace. I can merit an increase of grace through my free cooperation. All right? Um, uh, the Catholic faith also teaches that God desires the salvation of all people. And that he offers sufficient grace for all people to be saved. All right? Um, all those things, the Catholic, and God also te- uh, God, the Catholic faith and God also teaches that uh, that God predestines no one to hell. Here's what the Calvinists believe. This is different from the Catholics. The Calvinists believe number one that God predestines the vast majority of the human race to hell. That before the foundation of the world, God, you know, sitting around by himself, so to speak, says, hmm, "I think I'll create the world and send most people to hell." And that's what he does. That's what the Calvinists think, that most people are created for the express purpose of damning them. That's a pretty horrible doctrine, but that's what they believe, okay? And uh, and the Catholic Church says, no, God created the human race to be in fellowship with him, not for the purpose of damnation. But the Calvinists think that God gets his jollies by sending most people to hell, and that he determines to do so and makes it literally impossible for them to do otherwise. Calvinists also believe that if God chooses you for salvation, that his grace cannot be resisted. Uh, That's what they call irresistible grace. All right? Um, They're so serious, the Calvinists, about this business of God uh, not desiring the salvation of all, that they believe that Jesus did not even die for the whole world. That's called the doctrine of limited atonement. Catholics reject the doctrine of limited atonement. Um, and, uh, And finally, Calvinists also differ from Catholics in believing that grace cannot be resisted. That if God gives you grace, you're going to have grace and nothing you can do about it, all right? Uh, he's going to call you and get you to the end of the road, It's uh, and it's there's no cooperation on your part. And, of course, there's no merit either. Calvinists deny that we can merit, through our free cooperation, any increase in grace. So there are some stark differences between Protestants and Catholics on the doctrine of predestination. Um, and uh, the Calvinist doctrine, yes, is as horrible as it sounds. It mm-hmm. is as horrible as it sounds, okay? And... Um, uh, uh, so, um, yeah, there you go. There, it there is. you go. Uh, again, take a look at Gary Lagrange's book, Predestination, for a more thorough explication of the Catholic point of view. Sounds good. Donnell, thank you so much for your call. This is called to Communion here on EWTN. If you are looking for a unique setting for spiritual revival, here's something you might want to consider. The Shrine of the Most Blessed Sacrament, not too far from us. You can visit the final resting place of EWTN's foundress, our dear Mother Angelica. And you can tour the EWTN campus while you're in the area. It's only an hour away from the shrine there in Hansville. Start your Catholic pilgrimage today with EWTN by calling 205-271-2966. That's 205-271-2966. Or even easier and, and quicker, go to EWTN.com slash pilgrimage. EWTN.com slash pilgrimage. Call to communion in progress here on EWTN Radio. Let's go to Janine in Marion, Ohio, also listening on St. Gabriel Radio. Hey, Janine, what's on your mind today? Yes, hi. Hi. Um, 
I'm calling regarding my son. I'm a cradle Catholic, and my son has been baptized. He's 40, and um, he claims now that he is an agnostic atheist, and he loves to discuss things with me and to debate things, and I'm not very good at it myself, but he has... um, asked me to read two books, one by Richard Dawkins Mm -hmm. um, and one by Christopher Hitchens, Mm -hmm. I think it is. And in turn, I can come up with uh, two books uh, that I can ask him to read, uh, kind of uh, with the Catholic point of view, or uh, I'm, I'm really not sure what... To give him, um, I did have somebody. Uh, it was a pastor suggest not God's type as the name of one of the books, and this was evidently by a former atheist. And then he also recommended Orthodoxy by G. K. Chesterton. Oh. And um, you know, I'm not real sure what to do, but I- I'm very concerned about my son. Okay, I, I have a lot to say about that, and and while those are excellent books that your pastor friend recommended, they're the wrong books for this particular endeavor, okay? Uh-huh. Because, uh, especially, I'm, I'm not familiar with Not God's Type, but I don't like the sound of it um, for this purpose, for this purpose. And, and Chesterton's Orthodoxy, while it's a magnificent book, would do absolutely nothing to 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 answer the particular questions that your son is raising. So neither one of those is appropriate for this. Um, here's what you need to give him. I've actually got four books I want to talk to you about, and I know he's only willing to read two, but I might be able to squeeze two more in there, and I want to tell you why. Uh, the first one I want him to read is by David Bentley Hart, H-A-R-T. David Bentley Hart, H-A-R-T. The title of the book is The Experience of God. All right. It sounds like a book about the experience of God. That's not actually what it's about. <laughs> all right, it's a book about what what theistic believers mean when they use the word God. What does the word God mean across the history of the philosophical tradition? All right, because most atheists, when they tell you they don't believe in God, have no clue what Catholics mean by the word God. All right, they think they know, but they don't really know. Mm-hmm. David Bentley Hart does a good job of dispelling misconceptions about what is meant by the word God. Um, the second book is by Edward Faser, F-E-S-E-R, Edward Faser, F-E-S-E-R, and the book is Five Proofs of the Existence of God. Edward Faser, Five Proofs of the Existence of God, okay? Edward Faser, I think it's available at EWTN Religious Catalog. I believe so. Okay, but if not, it's published by Ignatius Press, mm-hmm. and it's available at many different booksellers. All right, now, those are the two books that I would like your son to start with. However, I've got two others that I think that he might take an interest in. All right, and I really, really think that they're worth looking at. One of them you might be able to squeeze in there, all right, because it's by an atheist. Not a former atheist, but an actual card-carrying atheist okay. who does not like religion and does not believe in God. Um, and I'll tell you why I want you to read it in a minute. Um, the book, the, the author is Thomas Nagel, N-A-G-E-L, Thomas Nagel, and the title of the book is Mind and Cosmos, Mind and Cosmos. Now, Nagel... Uh, does not like religion, and he does not like God, and he does not like Catholics. But he also doesn't like Richard Dawkins. <laughs> okay? And he understands that the kind of atheism that Dawkins is peddling is is shallow and weak-minded and unserious. And and Nagel, Nagel's book, Mind and Cosmos, while he does not ultimately arrive at belief in God, rejects, the radically rejects, the kind of worldview that Dawkins is peddling. And so if you tell your son... You know, look, this this Catholic guy on the radio who knows all about Dawkins says, here's an atheist that he actually likes, okay? And, uh, I mean, like, I like Nagel enough that, I mean, he's a lot smarter than I am, but I think if Nagel and I sat down together and, like, you know, had a beer, um, we, we would find an enormous amount that we agreed upon about the nature of reality, even though what, what he calls, like, the transcendent or ultimate reality, the absolute, I call God, okay? Um, and the final book... And uh, this one may be a harder pill for your son to swallow, but I really think, I really think at least you ought to take a look at it, is also by Edward Faser, F-E-S-E-R, and it is called The Last Superstition. Now, the reason I recommend this book second is it's about more than just the question of the existence of God. It does deal with the existence of God. It deals with other questions of the soul and morality as well, but it really goes after Dawkins. (laughs) 
and it does so very, very well with very sound philosophy. So, uh, The Last Superstition, Five Proofs of the Existence of God by Edward Fazer, The Experience of God by David Bentley Hart, and Mind and Cosmos by the atheist writer Thomas Nagel. That's the way you need to send your son. All right. Uh, And if you have any more trouble, give me a call back. Sounds like a plan. And if you need those titles again, just go to EWTNradio.net and you can listen to our podcast. Hey, Dr. David Andrews, thank you, my friend. Thank you, Tom. Don't forget, we do the program each and every Monday through Friday here on the radio, 2 p.m. Eastern, with an encore at 11 p.m. Eastern. We also pull the best show of the week, play that for you at 2 p.m. Eastern on Sundays on EWTN Radio. On behalf of our fabulous team, I'm Tom Price. You have a great day. See you next time right here on EWTN's Call to Communion. God bless.